be seated. Proverbs 11:30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. In the ESV version, it's the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Solomon is uh, David's son, uh, uh, was going to become the next king, didn't know how he was going to do what he was going to do, prayed, asked God for wisdom. God endowed him with wisdom, known as one of the wisest men, if not the wisest man who ever lived, wrote uh, much of our wisdom literature, wrote the book of Proverbs. And uh, in this verse, he says, the fruit of the righteous, again, is a tree of life. He who wins souls is wise. Well, I always took that one way, and it just seems to be, I, I felt like this week, there, there are possibly three different ways to translate or to look at this verse. And so we're going to look at those three ways here this morning. The first way um, that you can take this is, it is wise to evangelize. I didn't do that on purpose, but I like it. It is wise, that'd be a good bumper sticker. It is wise to evangelize. And uh, so what does that mean? Well, when you read it on the surface, it's telling us that it's, it's, it's using wisdom to win souls. That's how this verse has been taken by preachers all throughout history, all throughout Christendom. Evangelism is the task we've been given by God uh, to win the lost of this world. It is the mission that we are on. It is wise to engage in the task of winning souls. Daniel 12 and 3 says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. What's it talking about? I want you to the Lord. God used me to help bring you to God. James 5.19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, Oops, forgot to put verse uh, 20 up there. That's a good thing. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, he gave himself some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, not to do the work for you. He's talking to the church. Today, the mentality seems to be we hire a pastor so that they can run the church and they can preach and they can win the loss and they can do all those kind of things. And that's why the church is in the state it's in because we see ourselves as participants, uh, not participants, as uh, uh, spectators. We, we pay somebody to do the work, and the work will never get done because that's not how God designed it to do. Uh, evangelists are to equip the body to do the work of evangelism. So how do we reach the lost when we, all of us together, realize it's our job? our responsibility, our ministry, this is our commission, this is our uh, mission, this is our uh, uh, mandate, is to reach the lost, and every one of us should be engaged in some way reaching someone for Jesus. Not just the missionary, not just the pastor, not just the, the, the evangelist, but we all should have an impartation of that evangelistic anointing, uh, that evangelistic mission to go out and reach the law. 2 Timothy 4 and 5, but ye be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work in, of an evangelist, and in so doing, fulfill your ministry. Okay, so the second way to look at this, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise, is it takes wisdom to evangelize. It takes wisdom to evangelize. Whereas in the first point, we saw that the verse can be interpreted along the lines of it's wise to evangelize. It can also mean that in order to evangelize, uh, when we will add to that, evangelize effectively, it's going to take wisdom. The gist of what I'm trying to, to get us to grasp this morning is along the lines of something like this. He who wins souls must use wisdom to win them. What I mean by that is that every person is not the same, and they don't all start in the same place. Just like you don't have, uh, you know, every kind of, um, just like in construction, you don't just use one tool, right? I like to watch uh, when they rebuild houses. I, I love those kind of shows. I like to watch them from the beginning to the end. And one of the things that I don't like, I've never liked, I don't know why, because it seems to be what guys like the most is demo. They like to go in and they like to demo a house. They like to tear stuff down. I don't know why I don't like it. I just don't like it. I prefer to build stuff up. But uh, if you have, if you're going to demo, the tool of choice is a sledgehammer, right? And so you got a lot of guys carrying sledgehammers. Uh, the only problem is the sledgehammer is great for demo, but it's not good for a lot of other things. 
and if the only tool you have in your basket is a sledgehammer, uh, you may do some good every so often, but most of the time you're going to do a lot more damage, right? So you don't approach everybody with a sledgehammer. If I go to a doctor, and let's say the doctor's a surgeon, and everything that I bring up that I'm asking him about that, that I need some help with, he says, well, we need to, we need to do surgery. My tooth hurts. We need to do surgery. My toe hurts. We need to do surgery. My, you know, I'm not going to tell him about anything else because he's going to do surgery. If all he does is cut, something's wrong. If that's the only tool he's got in his basket, something is wrong. You're going to have to approach different problems, different people, different ways if you want to be effective at reaching them for God, right? So Matthew 9, 12, and 13 says, When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. So what is he saying? It's like a physician, right? I'm come to help those who are sick. Well, not everybody is sick the same way. Not everybody has the same problem. So if you're going to be an effective physician, you've got to be a good listener. You've got to find out what's going on with them. And you don't have just one remedy to deal with, with the problem. In fact, I, I had an issue uh, not too long ago, and I had to go to the doctor, and, and he, he would give me, he said, well, this should help you. He gives me a, a prescription, and I took it, took it, and when I took it, it did the opposite of what it was supposed to do. So he gave me another one, and we did this five different times. I think it was five. And all five different times, the medication he gave me did exactly the opposite of what he was supposed to do. And so he looks at me, and he says, well, that's why you go to school and you become a doctor, because everybody's not the same. You can't treat everybody the same. They, not only do they have different makeups, but they also respond differently to what you give them. And I said, how many people are there like me? He said, you're the only one I got. <laughs> he said, but the bottom line is he still had to work with me. And that's how we have to do with people that, that we're talking to. We have to realize that they're not all in the same place. You can't just go boom, 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 and expect that they're going to get saved. You need to make you need to, to make friends with them. You get, you get to know them, find out where they're at. What are their problems? They're not all dealing with the same problems. Some of them, uh, in my particular case, I, was, I, was, I didn't have a purpose in life. In other people's particular case, they need to get free from some addiction or some problem they're going through. Or they're, they're struggling with, uh, uh, you know, like, like the missionary said, they're struggling with thoughts of suicide. Other Reach them where they're at. What is the issue they're going through? Take the time to get to know them and, and use wisdom to say, how can I effectively reach them uh, so that we can, we, can, we can lead them to Jesus? I thought about the woman at Samaria in John 4, 7 through 15. There was a woman of Samaria that came to draw water. Jesus was there, and he said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, how many of you know he didn't just come in and start preaching to her? He used a, an everyday illustration, an everyday task that she was going through, and he flipped it around and used it to be able to gain an entrance into her life, right? So, uh, and going on in verse 13, uh, uh, she, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to, her, to him, Sir, give me this water. Open door. Open door. That I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Right? Wisdom to evangelize. You have to use the wisdom of God. That means you've got to uh, have an ear open to the Spirit of God, an ear open to the person that you're talking to. Right? Isn't the worst thing to go to a doctor and they don't even know you? They don't even see you? All they do is say, you got this condition, take this for your condition, but they couldn't care less who you are. They're treating a condition. They're not treating you. We can't treat a condition. We have to talk to the people. We have to get to know who they are. Yes, they have a condition, but the way you're going to really effectively deal with their condition is that, see, that, that doctor that doesn't look at me, doesn't talk to me, doesn't know who I am really, I'm going to go to another doctor who talks to me. I'm going to go to somebody else that has a relationship with me. They can all treat the same thing, but the one that's going to be effective is the one that actually connects with me. And that's what we have to learn. Amen? 
Acts 8, 26 through 38, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, the Lord is talking to uh, Philip, who is evangelizing in the, in the city of Samaria and effectively reaching the city. Great revival is taking place, and all of a sudden God says, I want you to go somewhere else. So he goes there, and he says, This is desert. So he rose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, one man, but he was a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and has come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. Now, how many know it's wisdom to follow the leading of the spirit? How many times has Bobby come in and said, I was just going by there. And the Lord said, go knock on that door. Go over there and talk to that person. It's wise to follow the leading of the Spirit. You say, well, God doesn't talk to me like that. I would beg to differ. I believe God does talk to us like that, but we don't all listen. We don't all pay attention because our focus is not to reach the lost. Our focus is to get through the day and do the work that we have to do. But what we want to do is we want to flip that and say, while you're doing the work that you do, realize that your greater work is to reach the lost. And keep an eye on the Spirit of God. And I, and, I, and I will suggest this, and I believe it to be true, that if your heart is to reach the lost, because the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, that God will help you to do the work effectively if you put his work first. Amen? So it's wisdom to follow the leading of the Spirit. And let's go on with this passage. Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Open door. Can you get teed up any better than that? So Philip, he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent. And so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away and he will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this of himself or of some other man? Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. It reminded me of when you were talking about Christmas. What? Tell us about Christmas. Open door, right? And she began to tell him about Jesus. It's wisdom also to begin at the place where God is already working in their lives. I believe that God, particularly when we start praying for people, that God goes before us and begins to work with people. Right? I like what somebody said. They said, they said uh, with Pharaoh, how did God work with Pharaoh and how did God work with Nebuchadnezzar? He gave him a dream. Right? They gave him a dream, and they knew there was something significant in the dream, but they had no concept of God. They had nothing of this. But God sent someone to follow up that could do something beginning where they were at. Tell me your dream. And when they began to tell him his dream, then all of a sudden God began to use that open door to open up the working of God within their life. So we have to find where is God working in their lives and how does God want me to fit in here so that I can begin to preach Jesus to them, right? And so as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now I brought this, I, I, what I want to bring out of this is it's wisdom to seek to bring the matter to a conclusion and actually lead them to a place of confession in Christ. I was listening to this um, the other day. It says, um, yes, it's good to plant seeds. We want to plant seeds. Sometimes we are planting seeds, but sometimes we don't know if the seed is ready to be uh, uh, produce fruit if we don't ask. Well, I'm planting a seed. Well, that's good that you're planting a seed, but have you asked? Uh, there might be, they might be ready for something more, but you'll never know if they're ready for something more if you don't ask, Right? I was listening to a, an ad on the a radio about a guy that was a very effective salesman. And he said, would you believe that I, I teach salesmen all the time? I'm always talking to them. One of the things that, that, that salesmen don't realize that they struggle with the most and the reason they don't get sales the way they think they should get sales is because they never learn how to close a deal. 
if you're a car dealership, they never get to the place and say, well, are we going to sell you this car today? And uh, what is it going to take to sell you this car? And let's, let's do a deal here today. Would you like to buy this car today? They can't bring themselves to that place. And so because they never ask the question, they, they get a lot fewer results than someone that's learned how to ask the question. The worst somebody can say is, I'm not ready yet. But maybe out of the five or six that you ask, maybe there are two that say, yes, I am ready. Right? I've got members of my family. My dad passed away a year ago, almost to the day he passed away a year ago. And, uh, and while I was in the hospital where my dad had, uh, uh, had, was in a place where they had COVID, he didn't die of COVID, but he died of COVID uh, after effects. But so we had a gown up and everything to go see him. And I was so grateful because there were a lot of people that had died before that that had to die without anybody being able to be with them. We were able to be with them. And while we were there, my, my nieces came in. I was able to call overseas to his brothers, my, you know, and talk to them. And while I'm talking to them, while I'm talking to, to some of my nieces, I said, you know, would you like to, I know Grandpa's going to go be with the Lord. He's saved. You know, we, we made sure of that. I said, and I just, I just for some reason felt impressed. I said, would you like to make sure that you're right with God? I had three of my family members that I can remember say, yes, I'm ready to. Right then, boom. I said, well, so we prayed right then. If you don't ask, you don't know. And so we've got to learn how to close and, and please don't, this sounds irreverent, but I'm just using it as a metaphor. We've got to learn how to bring it to a conclusion. We've got to learn how to close the deal, right? Would you want to get saved? As a preacher, if I had sat here and preached a sermon and never gave him an altar call, wouldn't you consider that to be ineffective? You need to give an altar call. What are you doing when you give an altar call? You're saying, hey, look, if you're ready, we are going to pray with you, and we want you to leave here saved different change we want to believe God we've got to learn how to do that right and then the third way we're going to get into the third way and I'm almost done believe it or not I, I told you the truth I'm trying to keep it to a minimum the third way is discipleship is acting wisely uh, Proverbs 11:30. the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and whoever captures souls is wise uh, I'm emphasizing the one whoever captures souls is wise in this case the meaning would be something like this the one who takes hold and shapes a soul as righteous is acting wisely so what we're really talking about is we're talking about discipleship right it's one thing to to bring someone to the point where they uh, confess the Lord Jesus Christ but you know that's just the beginning they have to be grown they have to be taught they have to learn how to live what God has made them God called them righteous now they have to learn how to live righteous it's wisdom to take them under your wing it's wisdom to bring them to a place where they can live out what they've confessed right Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, I already, I already used this, but I'm going to go a little bit farther with it. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord and love for all the saints. No, actually, this is another. I'm sorry. I thought the other one was Ephesians 4. Paul is praying. He said, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I was just going to pull out one verse, but I like to give you the context of what's going on. This whole thing is a prayer that Paul is praying over the church. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is Paul prays that the Ephesian believers would be given wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus. They're Christians. They've already been saved. But Paul's prayer is that they would be given wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What's not mentioned, but what we must realize is that Paul himself had been given wisdom and knowledge from God. And in that wisdom and knowledge that God has given him, 
God is using him to not only to pray for the Ephesian believers that they would grow in wisdom and knowledge, but also impart unto them what God had imparted to him. And how is he doing that? Through writing the scriptures that he wrote. It wasn't a scripture at the time. It was just a letter answering questions, dealing with problems. But in that letter, it became scripture. And we learn how to become effective Christians through what God had imparted to Paul and he was willing to give away. In wisdom, he was imparting wisdom. For what reason? That they might be more like Jesus. That they might become righteous. In fact, in Ephesians 4 and 1, it says, Now, I be, uh, 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 um, uh, Ephesians 4 and 1. This is why I carry a Bible. I know what this says, but when you got all these eyes looking at you, <laughs> you know, it seems to happen more the older you get. Ephesians 4 and 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and he just got through telling him in, in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, all uh, that he at this particular time was re revealing to them of what Jesus, what Jesus had done. All that Jesus had done through the work of Calvary, not everything, but what he's revealing at this particular time. This is what Jesus did for you. This is how God's functioning in your life. This is all these things that God has done. And then in verse 4, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Right? What have you been called to? To live righteously. What have you been called to? To live effectively, to live victoriously, to live an overcoming Christian life, to, to not just to get to heaven, but to demonstrate heaven where you're at. Right? And there's a lot of people that are just getting to heaven, but they're not living effectively and righteously in a way that represents Jesus the way he wants to be represented in this earth. And Jesus is saying, live worthy of the calling to which he's called you to live. Right? And I always like to use the illustration of a king who, when he is born, he's born a prince. From the time that he's a prince, he's called, he is the future king. From the moment that he's born, he's the future king. So what do they do? All that life of that child who is a future king, what do they teach him? How to live like a king. When you are born again, you are a child of the living God. You have been made righteous. You have called to be the light of God in this world. And so what Paul is saying, now this is what God has called you to. Now let's teach you how to live life in such a way that you demonstrate uh, uh, in your, by your life and by your actions uh, what it is that God has called you to be. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So this is what Paul is praying that would happen in their life. In short, what was Paul doing? He was discipling the church. He was discipling the converts. He was discipling them so that they could become more than converts. They would become disciples themselves. And this is what this verse can, and I believe in, in, in Proverbs, and I believe it truly means. He had been used, Paul had been used to evangelize them, and now he was being used to teach them so that they would live righteously. This is discipleship. It is wisdom to disciple someone. Discipleship is acting wisely. Why does God desire that we grow and mature as believers in Christ? And that brings me back to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying doesn't just mean, oh, you're so good, you're so dressed, so pretty, oh, you're so awesome. That can be edifying, but it also can be a lie. No. <laughs> just kidding. All right. Want to see if you're paying attention right? Uh, what it means is to build you up. Sometimes to build you up, I can't, I can't flatter you. I have to tell you the truth, right? You can't become better until you know, know that you're behaving poorly, right? You got, we got to know where you're at. So anyway, I got off on a tangent. I like rabbits. Let's get back. All right. So, uh, so it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That, that, that word perfect means mature. doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. Hopefully, the older we get, the less mistakes we make, or we make different mistakes, but we don't make the same mistake over and over and over and over again. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but that by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth... 
in love, right? We may grow up into all things unto him who is the head, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself, for the edifying of itself in love. So the purpose for our equipping and maturing as a body is that we would grow in love. And in our love, this is Rick Helgero taking it out to the, to, to, to the end of it. In our love, we would produce children, metaphorically. Right? In love with God, in love with one another, we have a love for the world, and because we have a love for the world, we go out there and metaphorically we get them born again. They are born children into the kingdom of God. Not because we have to, not because we got to get a notch, on, a notch on our belt, but because we love whom God loves. We have his heart for people, right? Genesis 1, 27, 28. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the seas, not over the people, but over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 18, 17, and 19. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have not have I not for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. I'm working with Abraham so Abraham can work with his descendants, his children and their children so they can learn how to live righteously. Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. How are we supposed to be training up children, not only our, our, our natural children, but also the children that God gives, gives us as we reach them for God? We are to train them up, and how are we supposed to train them? How to live life righteously, what God has called us to. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go therefore make disciples of all nations, all ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, not some, not most, but all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. That means that you don't get on a plane, because no. God's only with you when you're low. No, that's not what it means. Children learn by watching us and listening to us by what we say, and more importantly, by what we do. That's also how we disciple people. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, Paul said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Discipleship involves a teacher and a student. It involves a mentor and the one who's being mentored. It's not a system of teachings. It can use teachings, but it's not a system of teachings or a system of classes. It can involve that, but it is people who are willing to impart the life of Christ through their words and their actions into other people that they might become righteous not only positionally, but also functionally. This process of discipleship, taking hold of a soul and shaping them to live righteously, is according to our text what it means to behave wisely. So, what we saw here today, missionary that came here today, God's using her to go across the seas and in wisdom, through wisdom, to do what wisdom should do is train up people to know God and bring them to a place where they can follow God and live for God, and then they too can go out and reach other people for the Lord. But you don't have to go overseas to do that. We're called to the same place. We're called to do the same thing.